Let's, uh, let's meet our first guest, Mr. Malcolm X, the leader of the so-called black supremacy movement, the Muslims, and that's spelled M-U-S-L-I-M-S. -S. Yes, sir. And Mr. I understand that all of the members of the Muslims have the last name of X. That's correct. And why is that? Well, the X actually uh, identifies or distinguish with, distinguishes those of us who are followers of Mr. Elijah Muhammad from those who are not. I see. And it uh, also exits us from the usage and the identification and the connection with the uh, slave names that were given to our people during slavery time by the slave master. I see. And it's, it will stand until, uh, as you know, Mr. Muhammad, our leader and teacher, he received his name from God. And uh, those of us who follow him will receive our names. There will come a time when we will receive our names, just like the Bible says in the last days that God will give uh, the lost sheep or the lost people uh, names out of his own mouth. And we feel that we're living at a day and in a time when those biblical prophecies will reach their fulfillment here in America. Mr. X, I have no... Uh I have no argument with your wanting to call yourself X or Y or Z or anything, and I respect your motives, but Shakespeare said, what's in a name? What difference does it make? Sir, uh, when you say what's in a name, black people here in America who have gone into Mississippi using the names Smith and Jones and Murphy have encountered serious barriers which immediately were eliminated when they used names such as Sharif Hassan Bia and things of oh, that sort. So when Shakespeare said, uh, what's in a name, he probably had never lived in America with a dark skin. They took Arabic names to make the people think they were of Arabic extraction. A good uh, example of that last year was mentioned in Jet, where this uh, so-called Negro from Florida uh, spoke with a French accent in Mississippi and uh, gave himself another name, a foreign name, and was accepted into the veteran hospitals, white veteran hospitals. They took him for an African. Right. Uh, so there's much in a name. And uh, I understand. Yeah. Now, Mr. X, I said in introducing you earlier that your group has been charged with being anti-white, anti-Semitic, and a kind of black Ku Klux Klan. Now, you've heard that charge before. Yes, sir. And what is your answer to it? It's... Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, first, when you introduce me as the leader of the black supremacist movement here in Harlem or here in New York, that in itself, too, is incorrect. I'm uh, Mr. Elijah Muhammad's minister to the uh, New York Muslim area, and uh, he is the spiritual leader and teacher of all of the Muslims. And in fact, he's the spiritual leader and teacher of the fastest-growing group of Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. And here in the New York area, I represent him. I'm his minister. Where does the word Muslim come from? The word Muslim is an Arabic word, which means uh, it comes from the word Islam. Islam is the name of the religion that means yes. complete submission to the will of the divine supreme being. And uh, Muslim means one who has submitted himself to the will of the divine supreme being. Now, what's the difference between a Muslim and a Muslim? Uh, Muslim is only the anglicized pronunciation and spelling of the Arabic word Muslim. I see. Then uh, it is the same thing. The same thing. It's like if you were in Georgia, you say, you'd say horse, and in New York, you say horse. I understand. Same thing. Now, where do the charges come from that you are anti-white? I think that comes from people who uh, lack the proper understanding and have and who have uh, failed to do research. I think that some people who are bigoted and narrow-minded create the phrase, and others just follow suit by parroting without actually looking into what Mr. Muhammad is teaching and what he is doing. Uh, if you recall, and I think this is the best answer, when uh, T Time magazine uh, wrote an article in July or August of '59. Uh, in which they uh, uh, said that Mr. Muhammad had successfully eliminated from among his followers the use of alcohol, the use of dope, the use of, uh, of uh, profanity, uh, adultery, and things of that sort. But then at the same time, they turned around and accused him of teaching black supremacy. Now, mind you, they, they, they credited him, without realizing it, with reforming the morals of the so-called Negroes. And then in the next breath, 
they accuse him of black supremacy. In the same article, they pointed out that the police chiefs in uh, Los Angeles and across the country marveled at the degree of, uh, of uh, discipline and obedience and respect for the law right. that existed among his followers. And at the same time, they said that this is what worries the police department, why that's absurd. And uh, I think that uh, his teaching, Mr. Muhammad's teaching, gives such dignity, it puts such a, a sincere and strong dignity in those uh, black people who listen to his teaching and accept his teaching that uh, they give, they have, uh, they have had that inferiority uh, complex and attitude for so long that when they change it's so noticeable that people who don't understand, they, they associate it with an air of supremacy. But I think that's other than true. Malcolm X, the Chicago American, on February 22nd, said that your leader, Elijah Muhammad, wants to unite the darker races in exterminating the white race. I think, sir, that uh, the same, and this is uh, the same writer who wrote that, didn't even take the time during the convention. We had a convention three days at that time. That writer didn't take the time. Uh, to come to the convention and listen for himself what Mr. Muhammad uh, uh, is teaching or what he stated his aims were. I think had he done so that he would have written that article other than the way he did. Do you or your organization receive funds from the United Arab Republic? Uh, that's another thing that's, that could not be farther from the truth. We, we receive funds from no one, no outside government other than right here. We receive funds from ourselves. All of the finance, all of our projects are financed by so-called Negroes here in America who you, believe in Mr. Muhammad's program. You keep saying so-called Negro, Mr. X. What do you mean by that? Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked me that, too, because uh, when, I'm, when you ask a person his nationality and he says German, it, it identifies him with a nation called German, Germany. Right, right. If you ask him his nationality and he says French, it identifies him with a nation called France. If he says right. English, it identifies him with a nation called England. Right. Now, if you ask him his nationality and he says Negro, what has it identified him with? Only the color of his skin. But, no, uh, Negro is a Spanish word, not an English word. And the, the, here in the, present, in, the, in the school curriculum in this country, they have taught us uh, that black is something derogatory, so most Negroes take offense when referred to as black. But except, same, in, except in Africa. But understand. But at the same time, they say that the word Negro means black in Spanish. Uh, and they say that it, if, if Negro means black in Spanish, then all of the black Spanish-speaking people in South and Central America would also be called Negroes. And if you call a Puerto Rican or a Cuban or a Mexican or somebody who is black a Negro, he takes offense. A Spanish-speaking black person will not accept the term Negro. Well, I, I agree with you, Mr. X. The fact is that many people who make the same mistake about Negroes will speak of nationality and say that so-and-so is a Jew. That's a faith, not a nationality. Negro is not a faith. No, Negro is the color of a skin. A man, when you say that you resent or Negroes resent the word black, I've had Tom and Boya here on a couple of occasions, and he tells me that in Africa, the word black is applied by them to themselves. Yes. There are the blacks or the Africans. But not Negro. No. Negro, Negro carries with it a stigma. Well, only because of the unfortunate propaganda through the years. But this doesn't mean that it should. Sir, Negro is a word that was made up for us, not by uh, we ourselves, but by our slave master during slavery time. Now, uh, people of India, you have people in India who are darker than people in Africa. Yes. They're not called Negroes. You just can't, uh, you can't, if you, when you trace it down or try and use uh, well, What would you call yourself? A black right? man. My, I refer to myself as a black man, despite complexion. Uh, uh, I, I should tell the radio audience that you're very fair. Very uh, light. Yes. And, uh, uh, but, see, it's just like... Wouldn't colored be a more applicable word? No, sir. Uh, colored to us means that which has been changed from what it originally was. Mm. Uh, those of us today who, are, who have been taught by Mr. Muhammad, we accept the term black. We refer to ourselves as black despite complexion, and this gives us unity. As long as you have a group of people like the Negroes, different complexions, uh, uh, and, they are, uh, and they lay stress upon their complexion, that creates a division. And what we need, since we have been, since one of our characteristic uh, uh, qualities is our disunity, 
uh, we as so-called Negroes in America don't need any terms that tend to lend to that disunity. We need to be in united instead of disunited. Malcolm X, uh, why is it that Roy Wilkins of the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall, their counsel, are so opposed to your movement? Are they not hard-working individuals for equality and desegregation? Sir, I don't think that... Uh, Mr. Wilkins and Mr. Marshall are actually opposed to Mr. Muhammad's movement because Mr. Muhammad's movement is actually doing what they are advocating, the betterment of our people. Uh, Mr. Uh, many people have put words in Mr. Wilkins' mouth and have put words in Mr. Marshall's mouth, but I don't think that men of that standing and of that caliber and with that intelligence would cast opinions about a group such as ours wow. without coming to us or coming among us and studying us Mr. firsthand themselves. Mr. X, I must tell you that Thurgood Marshall has been here on a many occasions and he has stated to me that he is opposed to your group. Now he's a learned and informed man and he's told me this is not a not something that I've heard. I think you'll find, sir, that many Negroes who reach I wish you'd stop calling me sir. I was just a corporal. Well, uh, sir, uh, we one of the things Mr. Muhammad teaches us is to respect everyone. And I uh, do it not... You call I, me Barry. I think that's enough respect. Well, yes, sir. I'll call you uh, Barry. Much better than, hey, you. I've been called that. <laughs> but what you will find that one of the things characteristic, too, about Mr. Muhammad's followers is courtesy is a part of our religion. And I respect it. And uh, it's, hard, it's difficult for us to separate ourselves from our religious teachings. May I say, as a former G.I., that there are ways of saying sir and other ways of saying sir, and sometimes it doesn't sound very respectful. Oh, well, I understand. <laughs> Let me pause here and tell you that I'm talking with Mr. Malcolm X, the leader of the movement of the Muslims, or Muslims. Let me return to my guest. My guest is Malcolm X, the leader, or associate leader, I guess you'd call it, of the movement called the Muslims. Mr. X, you've, uh, you've denied here that your group is anti-white, anti-Semitic, and in some cases anti-Negro. Uh, a colleague of mine and an old friend, Mike Wallace, last summer showed some films of your local rally. And he charged then that you have a stormtrooper type operation and that your leader, Elijah Muhammad, has a bodyguard of the elite troop character. Is that so? I wouldn't say that we have a storm. <coughs> Before you go to that, so you asked me about Thurgood Marshall and uh, Wilkins. I would like to yeah. make a comment. Go ahead. Uh, uh, number one, it hurts me to, if they said what they did, which I've never heard it, but it hurts me whenever any uh, so-called Negroes like that speak out against uh, us because we think that uh, black people have enough enemies today uh, fighting uh, to make the mistake of fighting each other, fighting among themselves and fighting each other. And I'm very reluctant to make any statement against any so-called Negro today who even professes to be fighting the battle for justice for the so-called Negroes. If they want to attack us, they're free to do so. But we find that we have our hands full enough fighting for justice for the so-called Negro to, to, to spend time fighting Mr. Uh, uh, Marshall and Mr. Wilkins. Well, I understand that, but on the other hand, in a democratic society, Mr. X, no one expects all Negroes or all anything to agree. But you got a new Negro on the scene today, sir, who's fast rising, who's rising up faster than I think even Mr. Wilkins and Mr. Marshall who's are that? aware of. And uh, I said a new Negro. When I say a new Negro, a new collective Negro. Yes. Whereas in the past, Negroes were reluctant to stick together on certain issues, and they were reluctant to uh, exhibit uh, action other than passive. Today, they'll try it passive. If passive will work, and if passive doesn't work, they'll, they resort to what will work. What, what, what do you mean by what will work? Uh, Does that mean violence? No, sir. Uh, because I would not want you to think that the uh, followers of Mr. Muhammad are people of violence. But when you stop to think, sir, 
Uh, uh, who does Mr. Wilkins speak for? Who does Mr. Thurgood Marshall speak for? If, if Roy Wilkins and Thurgood Marshall combined com, uh, advertised the fact that they were going to give a lecture or a speech Saturday afternoon on 125th Street and, uh, and 7th Avenue in Harlem, they probably would be lucky to get a thousand people. If you advertise the fact that Mr. Muhammad was going to speak at that same place, you couldn't get within four blocks of the place. This is facts. Now, well, uh, Mr. Mr. X, to use your your very analogy, I'm sure that if Hitler was around, he'd draw a pretty big crowd too. Uh, I'm surprised that a man of your intelligence and experience would uh, use uh, the name Hitler in the same breath. No, but you've told uh, me about the crowd. Sometimes, you know, the public is not always right. Well, then who speaks for who? This is the thing. If Roy Wilkins is the well, spokesman... I assume, I assume that Roy Wilkins and, and uh, Thurgood Marshall speak for all of the paid-up members or contributors of the NAACP. Now, I don't know what that number amounts to. Yes, sir. But people that contribute to an organization obviously believe in it, yes. and they represent these people. I don't think Roy Wilkins ever said that he speaks for all the Negroes of the United States, and I know Thurgood Marshall not only professionally but personally. And I'm sure that Thurgood Marshall doesn't believe that he speaks for all of the Negroes because there are some Negroes he has very little use for. And he wouldn't want to speak for them. Well, there are no Negroes that we don't have any use for. We love all of them. But you're putting them in the same category, if I may say, as the racists, uh, racists on the other side put the Negro. You're making all Negroes good Negroes and all whites bad whites. We think, sir, that the bad qualities and bad characteristics that you might detect uh, in the so-called Negroes today are uh, due to sociological conditions under which they uh, live, uh, for uh, the, which we feel they are not responsible for. The, uh, most of the faults that you find, faults of drunkenness, fa uh, faults of dope addiction and things of that sort, uh, we don't feel that the Negro in America is having undergone 310 years of slavery, during which time he was uh, stripped completely of his culture and anything that would give him dignity or uh, racial cohesiveness to the point where he would want to stand up only under extreme circumstances. We just don't hold him responsible for, for that. Uh, these who have had an opportunity... You're not going to excuse it. We're not excusing it in this day and time, but we don't hold him responsible. The, the, the you are then saying, if I understand you correctly, that all Negroes who are involved in uh, narcotics traffic, addiction, drunkenness, whatever. These people are to be excused? No, sir. But I am saying that I think that the white man who is familiar with the history of the Negro in America, when he sees the faults that the Negro displays today here in America, the white man himself should be very slow to criticize or condemn that Negro I, for, I, his, for his condition. Mr. X, I neither criticize nor condemn. I'm trying to, trying to get a story, except I'd hate to think that we're going to uh, present the, uh, the uh, satire of a poor, downtrodden individual who's just crooked because he never had a chance. Because some of our finest citizens in this community, Negro and white, have come out of those poor, downtrodden conditions. Principal and... Uh, and the fiber of character are very strong things. They overcome a great many setbacks. And I'm not going to tell you that e the Negroes have had an easy row to hoe. They've had a very tough row. But isn't it strange that out of that very background have come some of your most remarkable people? Yes, sir. And, and there are those few. <clears throat> we don't uh, clap our hands and say hooray over the few. We're thinking of the masses oh, I think there are who, many more who, than few. who are yet in that downtrodden condition. I sir. agree. But Mr. X, we're getting far away from the subject. What about your the elite bodyguard and the stormtrooper type operation that Mike Wallace showed on film last year? I think that uh, Mike Wallace showed, I don't think he showed anything that you could call stormtrooper, but he probably uh, showed something that could be classified as elite in the sense that uh, the followers of Mr. Muhammad are uh, taught uh, discipline and courtesy and, and uh, uh, hygiene, physical hygiene, uh, mental hygiene, spiritual hygiene, to the point where uh, they are very uh, easy to distinguish between others. 
Uh, Mr. X, you've just told me about the great mental hygiene of your leader. Is it true that he was in prison in the federal penitentiary for three years, beginning in 1943, for subversive activity? He was in prison for refusing to go to the army, for refusing to fight. He, he is a Muslim. He teaches the religion of peace. And he was sent to prison for refusing to go to the war. That was why he was sent to prison. I am given to understand that it's because he aligned himself with the Black Dragon Society of Japan. That's absurd. If he had aligned himself with the Black Dragon Society of, J of Japan, sir, well, br bring in your Federal Bureau of Investigation and ask them. Well, Mr. Mr. X, a man does not go to prison under our society if he can prove that he is a legitimate conscientious objector. We had many such uh, during the war. Sir, I think you'll find that prisons were filled with conscientious objectors. We have brothers right at this moment who are serving prison sentences for conscientious, well, uh, being conscientious objectors. Because possibly that their, their background did not show a legitimate reason. They became conscientious objectors for the purposes of the draft. I don't quite understand. Well, let me give you a very well-known example. There was a man named Lou Ayers, yes. who is a Quaker. And Mr. Ayers, known as a Quaker and a very religious man, would not bear arms. So he became a member of an ambulance unit. And he did not bear arms. He was a conscientious objector. The medical corps was filled with hundreds of men who would not bear arms but worked as laboratory technicians and the rest. But those who suddenly became conscientious objectors on the day that the draft called them were put in prison because there was no record of their ever having been a member of a religious group or sect that would uh, prove this point. Yes, well, I think you'll find, sir, that uh, uh, nearly a hundred of Mr. Muhammad's followers went to prison along with him for refusing uh, to go to the army. And by refusing to go to the army, they absolutely didn't even register. They had no part of the war whatsoever, but it wasn't in line with Japan or because of what Japan was doing. Let me quote to you from the Chicago American. It says here that in 1942, the Chicago Herald American, this newspaper's predecessor, exposed a fifth column plot designed to unite the world's dark-skinned people under Japan and exterminate the white race. Elijah Muhammad, alias Elijah Poole, alias Elijah Mahmoud, was accused by the FBI of being one of the leaders in this fantastic plot. When the FBI tracked him to his mother's home in Chicago, they found him rolled up in a carpet under her feet. Sir, I think oh, you will find... Well, yes, okay. This is the FBI. You said you wanted the FBI quote. <laughs> Leaders of the sect were charged with violating the Federal Espionage Act. Conviction under that law carried a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison and a $10,000 fine for each offense. The FBI said the subversive groups numbering 100,000 persons throughout the United States had been organizing for more than 10 years under the Japanese Black Dragon Society. A four-month undercover investigation by the Herald American brought to light the activities of these groups, and these findings were turned over to federal authorities. When questioned by Assistant U.S. Attorneys William J. Connor, John Keeley, and Leroy Crine, all the leaders denied they were citizens of the United States, all asserted they were born in West Asia, that they were Asiatics and Muslims and not subject to American laws. Records, however, showed they were all born in this country, and Mohammed and one other were arranged on sedition charges and held in bond after the U.S. Commissioner said these men were leaders in this dangerous, subversive plot. It was at their behest that many of the others evaded the draft, they also advocated direct alliance with this nation's enemy, Japan. Sir, I completely uh, disagree. And uh, that I read that in the Chicago paper when I was out there last week. If Mr. Muhammad and his followers were arrested for that, were they convicted for that? Well, they went to jail for no, three years. Sir, That's a no, good sign. Sir, no. They went to jail for refusing to register for the draft, but they were not convicted of any kind of espion espionage. Mr. X, and, sir, today they aren't on the uh, attorney general subversive list, and if they said they weren't citizens, the United States Senate right now is putting on a filibuster in Washington, D.C. to prove that the black man here is not a citizen.
Yes, it, but I don't accept that, do you? Oh, uh, you are the, an individual, the, sir. The federal law of this country states that anyone naturally born in the United States is a citizen of this country, whether he be of the black race, the yellow race, or the white race. And as a matter of fact, the, the Japanese in California had the same difficulty for a very long time. But anyone born in this country, naturally born, is an automatic citizen, and it can never be denied. Do they deny these uh, Japanese and white people civil rights? You see, civil rights makes a man a citizen. You've you got an argument in Washington right now uh, that revolves around civil rights, which yes. is supposed to make Negroes citizens. No, it, it, they, it's, sir, it's supposed to give them voting privileges. It does not have anything to do a with citizen citizen. Has voting privileges. I know. And we, if he doesn't have voting privileges, he's not a citizen. Well, he has voting privileges in the South if he pays his poll tax, and I'm against that. But understand, sir, and I think that you're intelligent enough to see that any time you have to uh, make new bills or pass new bills to make uh, uh, to give voting privileges or voting rights to approximately 20 million black people, then you just can't call those people citizens. Well, let's go back to your leader. According to the Chicago newspaper, at a meeting September the 13th, 1942, this same Elijah Muhammad told his followers, and this is a direct quote, the red background of the flag of Islam represents the sun. The crescent and star represent the moon and the planets. The other flag you see there, the stars and stripes, is the symbol of the white devils. There is only one flag for us, and that is the flag of Islam. See how it compares with the Japanese flag of the rising sun. The reason for the likeness is that the Japanese are our brothers. They are the only ones who can give us justice, freedom, and equality. And at a meeting of one of the subversive groups, one of the leaders exhibited a movie showing the Japanese version of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and the followers cheered loudly. Speakers at some of the meetings uncovered by patriotic Negro organizations made statements as, Our prayers were answered with the bombings of Pearl Harbor. God bless Hitler. Tojo will save American Negroes from the white yoke. Great Japanese victories leave fewer victims for us. And on March 5, 1935, 200 members of the group rioted in the Chicago courtroom of Municipal Judge Edward S. Scheffler. Uh, sir, I'm surprised that you would take a newspaper, uh, which you could, pardon me, Go ahead. which you can get one printed in Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and Chicago. <coughs> There's no exception. This is a newspaper with millions of dollars of assets, Mr. X. The, the, you and have, if you wanted to sue them, it's very simple. No, you have papers in Mississippi that have million dollars worth of assets. The assets are of no consequence whatsoever. Oh, you have to, you but can sue Concerning the flag, the sun, moon, and star, the Shriners, which is one of the top orders of the Masonic, they use the crescent. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I have no uh, objection to your flag, uh, and particularly the flag of Islam. I do have objection to the speeches that this man has made, and incidentally, the stupidity of the statement that God bless Hitler, because I seem to recall Hitler and a man named Jesse Owen. Yes, I understand. The, if you will take that paper, which you've never seen until it was put in front of you, oh, I saw it earlier and, today, and uh, I reached the conclusion that the man said it without doing some investigation for yourself, you're overlooking the fact that Mr. Muhammad has united and reformed and is reforming more Negroes than any other black man in America. You're overlooking the fact that uh, uh, he's creating love and brotherhood among his people that didn't exist before. You're overlooking the fact that he's making law-abiding citizens out of black people who had no regard or respect for law before. You're overlooking all of these positive qualities. Well, not only... And not pulling only. out something, sir, that was planted in a newspaper huh. 20 years ago. No, no, this is from... This is the issue of February 22nd, 1960. What you're quoting, sir, was written 20 years ago. What you're quoting was written 20 years ago. It came out in the paper in Chicago last week to try and keep the... make the Negroes in Chicago afraid any time you can find a black man. Mr. X. Yes, sir. There's one so-called black man. I don't use the term, but there is a black man named Lestra Brownlee. Yes. And he writes a column... Yes. ...in which he says that your organization has great similarities with Hitlerism. He says both have made a strong appeal to the frustrated, pointing up injustices, both use hatred to pit one group against another. Both spread the quasi-religious doctrine of racial superiority. 
Both attack Christianity and democracy as incompetent to solve problems. Both use the approach of a demagogue. Both demand fierce loyalty of followers. Both started inside the framework of the law. Both indoctrinated youth. Both built an elite guard. Both allied their causes which other, with other nations which had similar doctrines. In Muhammad's case, with the rising tide of nationalism in Africa today. Now, that's a Negro writer who uh, wrote that. You're right. He's a Negro writer, sir. And the thing that surprises me about what you're saying, you're overlooking the fact that <clears throat> Mr. Muhammad just finished a tour of the Muslim world, the Muslim countries of Africa and Asia, uh, at which time he was uh, warmly received at the holy city of Mecca and Medina in Arabia. And you cannot call a Muslim who enters uh, Mecca a pseudo-Muslim or a member of a quasi-religion. Uh, and also, sir, I think you'll find that uh, if you think that Mr. Muhammad is anti-white, you cannot, uh, no white person can come around any group of black people and get more respect than they will get when they come amongst the followers of Mr. Elijah Muhammad. I think one thing that the white man should know is this. There's a new Negro. There's a new thinking going on among Negroes. And it's the uh, misinformation that's being given to the white man by the leaders he himself has put up there to keep him informed that makes him not aware today of the, of the dissatisfaction and the degree of it and the intensity of it that's the existing among the Negroes. And because Mr. Muhammad comes along and expresses it openly and frankly so that you will understand, instead of listening to what he's saying and taking that as a warning, you are making the mistake of condemning the man as a hate teacher. A warning of what, uh, Mr. X? Sir, you reap what you sow. As you reap, well, as you sow, so shall you well, reap. Well, let me put it this way. There are 170 million people in the United States, and I venture to say that the overwhelming number of them are very much for civil rights, because the South is certainly a minority group of our total population. Would you say that all of the white people should reap as they sow? Sir, if the overwhelming number of white people in America are for civil rights, why do you have such a difficult time getting a civil rights bill passed? Because of our, the makeup of our political chamber. Sir, if the number in America of whites for civil rights was overwhelming, there is no combination of schemes that Southern senators could concoct to get that bill from being passed. Well, you have President to... Eisenhower himself has just made a tour of Africa, Asia, and South America, and he has not said one word yet against the uh, atrocities that are being committed uh, against black people here in America. Well, you wouldn't expect the president to go abroad and make that kind of a speech, would he you? He hasn't made a speech such as that in Washington, sir. I wouldn't expect well, him to make I'm, it abroad. Well, I happen to be a, of democratic persuasion, so please don't ask me to defend the president this week. Yes, sir. Uh, how about Hubert Humphrey? Hubert Humphrey is one man. Yes. If President Pre the Eisenhower is the president, he has he has influence enough to speak out on any kind of situation. Well, I agree with that. But what about Hubert Humphrey? What about the great and Hubert decent Hubert Humphrey, what sir, is not the president? What about the great? Well, he may be Hubert president. Hubert Humphrey doesn't represent the United States of America as such. Eisenhower yeah. represents the thinking of the United States, oh. the program, I the have principles no, I have no of the United States, and if he doesn't speak out against these atrocities, then who will? Mr. X, let me ask you this. Aren't you building, in your way, a black supremacy group just like the Ku Klux Klan has built a white supremacy group? I, What's the difference? Sir, I think that as a white man, you yourself should uh, use or exercise caution in referring to any black group in America in the same breath with the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was set up and designed to uphold white supremacy, rightly or wrongly, yet that's what their program is. Now then, uh, we uh, represent a group that has been oppressed by whites for 400 years. There is a white, the white man cannot deny that we were kidnapped and brought here. He can't deny that we were stripped of our culture, stripped of our language, stripped of our flag, stripped of our identity, and then robbed of 310 years of free labor. He can't deny that. Now, 
any group today that voices resentment and speaks it openly and frankly, the white man, since his hands are so blood-soaked, he should feel guilty. And he shouldn't feel vindictive. He shouldn't say, why, this man is a hate monger. Instead, he should go and talk to that man and say, well, now, listen, we are guilty of this. What can we do to right things? What can we do to correct things? And especially in light of the fact that the senators will stand up on the, on the floor of the Senate and say some of the most outrageous things about the black man in America, and not one time on your program even, sir, would you accuse uh, 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 McClellan, who received a, an award recently. Oh, you haven't, you haven't heard this broadcast. Regularly. I listen to you. I admire Senator your outspoken. Ma Sen Senator McClellan has had a couple of lumps on this microphone, and so have all the southern senators. You'd be surprised how many white people agree with Mr. Muhammad, and right, and I mean intelligent white people That's who fair. are not what you call bigots, but who are open-minded, both Democrats, Republicans, and otherwise. Well, if and that's the case, then I suggest you, you form a political party and run candidates. And, and so I would like to say, if you allow me, that uh, uh, one of the things that has caused so much unrest and is going to cause worse unrest is this integration thing uh, that uh, they're trying to put across and which the masses of... Mr. X, I'm terribly sorry. We have to break for the midnight news on Radio WMCA. We'll be right back. And now my guest again, Malcolm X. And Mr. X, we've spent almost an hour talking, and I have other guests, so I would like to ask you to provide some uh, wind-up comment, if you will, about your movement. Yes, sir, I think, sir, and I really appreciate your uh, allowing me to say these things, because I think that if the white man had a better understanding of what Mr. Muhammad is actually teaching and doing, that there would be no disagreement between him and us. But, Mr. X, the, fe the federal government obviously knows what he's doing. I think, sir, that you will not find us on any government subversive list. No, no, no. No, I'm talking about his jail term. Uh, uh, you will find also, sir, that I don't think it's a disgrace for any man to have gone to prison for, uh, because he felt that fighting was other than religious. And I think also, sir, uh, you will find... And, and if you think that, uh, that Mr. Muhammad is not expressing the views of many, many, many masses of Negroes, I would advise those who listen to this to write into you and let you know how they feel. Right. And I think that it would be a better representative. You probably would be more receptive to what your audience had to say than what I say. Mr. X, I, you tell me that you've listened to this broadcast a great many times. We had a lot of people in this country that thought Mac McCarthy was a, a kind of a... Uh, uh, an elevated political figure, and they wrote to me too. You know why I think that uh, most people misunderstand? They don't realize the religious, the actual uh, uh, essence of the, our religious uh, interpretation. Uh, we, when, when we look at Mr. Muhammad, we look at, at him as Moses. We look at uh, the Bible. I can't recall the Bible saying anything about Moses having an elite troop of guards. I think you'll find, sir, that Moses was a person who came to separate his people from the slave master. Moses didn't advocate integration. Moses advocated separation. Did they march? Uh, Moses, Moses was a man who appeared to slaves, and his mission was to separate those slaves from their slave master so God could destroy the slave master. And we feel that those Bible stories, sir, are only symbols that paint prophetic pictures of the day and time that we're living in right now. I cannot recall any word of Moses in the, in the Old uh, Testament professing anything of hatred. Uh, and, and, all I've, sir, and all I've read here, according to these newspaper reports, which if they are untrue, you have every right to sue for enormous sums of money. All I've read here are uh, speeches of hatred made by your leader. Sir, I think you can read the congressional record in the morning and find some speeches that, that are more hate-filled uh, being delivered by the senators from the floor of the United are, States Senate. We are not talking uh, about the senators. And while I'm on the subject of the Old Testament, I would remind you that it was Moses who fled from the Muslims his slave masters. No, sir, I think you'll find that uh, in those days, Moses... Uh, well, and first, number one, we don't even uh, look at the uh, thing as literal, but a symbolic story referring to today, that this is uh, the story of the house of bondage represents America, the Hebrew children represent the so-called Negroes, Moses in that day represents Mr. Muhammad here in America today to us. And uh, we feel that that is a warning 
just as Moses' job was to warn the slave master that it was time for God oh. to, to bless his people, Mr. Muhammad's job here in America today is to warn the white man, not condemn him, but warn him. Warn him uh, of what? Warn him that as you sow, so so shall you the word, the word warn has an ominous sound. You mean that for every Negro that's been lynched, a white person will be lynched? Uh, I think you'll find, sir, that the law of justice is, and God is a just God. If God visited the slave master in Egypt uh, for what it, what he did to the slaves, and he visited the slave master in Babylon for what he did to the slaves, if you look at that and see how God worked in the past and you don't think he's going to work the same way today, then I think that it's, it's foolhardy. I am simply on the record against anyone who preaches hatred, sir, and I believe that your leader preaches hatred. I don't think you really feel I, that, sir. I do believe I, it. I really don't. I don't believe in black supremacy any yeah. more than I believe in white supremacy. I don't believe in supremacy of anything except the Almighty. And uh, I, I get very nervous about people who stand around and try to build us up so we're ready to march. Sir, God is considered supreme because he was first and will be last. His people are also consider considered supreme because just as he was first and will be last, they were first and will be last. That which is first and last is supreme. I was neither first nor do I expect to be last. I thank you for coming I here. thank you, uh, Mr. Gray. Ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm X of the... So-called, it's been described as such, the black supremacy movement, the Muslims. Their leader, Elijah Muhammad. We've been spending, we've spent more than an hour on this discussion. We have uh, many guests.